we acknowledge the first Australians as the traditional custodians of the continent, whose culture is the oldest living culture in human history. We pay our respects to elders, past, present and emerging, and we respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We extend our respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. They share the memories, traditions and hopes of the traditional ancestors with the new generation today and in the future. We would also like to thank them for looking after this land for thousands of years. Good afternoon everyone and welcome to day three of SciFest 2023. We're excited today to be joined by Jessica from uh, Sydney Zoo to talk about innovation in animal care. Oh hi Emmanuel, you've been with us for a few sessions today. Um, so I'm going to pass straight over to, to her to get started. Remember, um, Jess is going to ask some questions to you that you can put in the chat. But if you've got questions for her, please put them in the Q&A and I'll ask them as we go through. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, welcome everybody to Sydney Zoo virtually. Very excited to be part of SciFest, such a great program. Um, and we're really excited for Science Week. We've actually put on a whole program of events here at the zoo and SciFest is just part of that. Uh, and we are looking at innovation in animal care. So the animal care industry is a large industry. It includes zoos and wildlife parks. Um, you know, you've got veterinary science, you've got lots of different avenues there for innovation in the animal care industry. And today specifically, I'm talking um, all about enrichment. So um, I've got a few things I'm gonna share with you throughout the program. And I'm gonna show you some different items that our zookeepers have been making. Um, and even buying. So lots of different things to enrich the lives of our animals. But what is enrichment is probably the first thing that I should cover. So enrichment is a way that we provide animals with choice and control in an animal care environment. So we know they're not in the wild, but we try and replicate the wild as much as we can uh, and giving them opportunities to display natural behaviors, um, develop natural skills that they would have and to stimulate all of their senses. So there are lots of ways we can do this and I'm going to talk through them today. So um, as we go through, I'm going to ask you a few questions about what do you think this animal would be um, that would use this? And I've got a few guessing games as we go through um, and I'll talk about those five senses that we try and engage with our animals. And then um, I'll show you a whole bunch of things our animals have actually been using recently. So I'm actually going to share some content with everybody. So let me just bring that up on screen. It's going to start our broadcast. Okay, here we go. I'm going to bring up our innovation. We've got innovation in enrichment. So you can see Charlie there. He's one of our um, tigers and looking at something that's new on his habitat actually. And I'll show you a video of him using that in a minute. So hopefully you all know what innovation means as well as we go through today, but basically renewing or changing or upgrading um, what we already have so that it's better next time. So innovation is really important for our zookeepers. They're constantly reviewing and looking at different things and going, how can we make that better, more enriching for our animals? There's so many different things they can do um, when it comes to enrichment. So I'm going to show um, a couple of things we've been doing this week. We've been talking to lots of students coming through from schools. We've been talking to lots of the public, lots of families coming through. And you can see some of the enrichment items in this photo that I'm going to talk about throughout this presentation. Um, and this is, you can see an image there of our amphitheater, which I'm currently standing in. And I'll show you um, how big that is and what other things we've got on display in a second. Um, but we've also been sharing some other ways that keepers have been innovative in animal care separate to enrichment. So this is an image of some high school students who've been working with the zoo um, to look at the poo. And you think, how is poo innovative? How is it something new and different? But the way we study poo has become so awesome that it's actually really exciting to listen to people talk about poo, which sounds so strange, doesn't it? But here at the zoo, we have lots of animals that we call fermenters or hind gut fermenters. So animals that need lots of bacteria in their guts to break down all the food um, and help them to break it down and digest. And so these students, along with some microbiologists, were studying the, the what microbes were living in those 
animals. And so to do that, they had to collect lots of poo and, um, and go and do lots of tests in a lab. And then they came up with some results that showed us exactly what's living in our rhinoceros. So Tino is his name. We had um, them looking at elephant poo. We've got two boys here, two boy elephants, and looking at their poo. We then looked at capybaras and wombats as well, and they found all of them completely different to each other, different species living in their guts. So that's another way that um, animal care here at Sydney Zoo is, is changing and getting better and uh, being innovative is how we study poo. And then that actually was so interesting that our nutrition centre might change what we feed some of our animals because of how it impacts their guts. And um, there's so many different avenues we can use that information to make it the lives and, um, and food and everything around our animals better. Um, and that's all about what innovation is all about. So that's another thing we've been sharing during this science week. <clears throat> but I'm gonna move on now. I'm gonna show you all a video um, and you're welcome to write in the chat. I'm gonna ask you what habitat do you think this at this is and what animal you think lives in there. You'll see some keepers in there. It's a bit of a time-lapse video, um, setting up bits of enrichment around the place. So see if you can write in the chat and answer the question, who do you think would live in that environment? We'll see if we get any answers. Ooh, we've got gorillas, apes, orangutans, monkeys. Ooh, cool, you're all on the right track. I bet you're all gone, wow, look at all the ropes and things to climb on. And you're right, this is actually our chimpanzee exhibit. So well done to all those who guessed apes or similar or, um, or monkeys. They're not monkeys, obviously. Great apes are a little bit different to monkeys. They don't have a tail for one and they're really, really intelligent. They, they're very closely related to people. So we've got 97% or more of their DNA. So it's very closely related. And so our chimpanzees um, have this habitat. It's not, it doesn't show their entire habitat. This is just part of it. Um, and the chimpanzees aren't allowed on the habitat while there are zookeepers there too, just in case you're worried about that. If you look in the back corner there, there's a big red building or big brown building. That's their, um, their bedroom essentially. And they've been called in there for breakfast on this particular day last week uh, when I was filming. And uh, they're happily eating breakfast while the keepers are out um, changing up all of their enrichment. So... One of the ways we can enrich our animals is actually all about designing of their habitat. So we look at specific animals and we go, okay, what does that specific species need in their habitat to have a really exciting, fulfilling, active life? Um, and then we go, well, we also might have different personalities in our groups and well, what do they like specifically too? So we don't just tailor it to the species. We also look at their, their personalities too. And so for our chimps, we know how much they love to climb and swing and play. Um, and so we change the ropes that you see in there. There's a big hammock there, which I'll talk a bit more about later. Um, you can see uh, lots of climbing frames and logs to climb on too. And they get changed quite regularly. So they're not always the same, just like in the wild, they'd be going through different parts of the forest, the canopy, it would all be different um, every day they're wandering through. So we try and mimic that here. So for example, another example, our lions, our hyenas and our painted dogs here, I don't have an image of this, it just came to mind. Um, they all have big hills inside their habitats and they can see each other. It's very unusual for zoos to be to allow that. It's kind of new and up and coming research and it's a great part of enrichment is letting other animals see each other and they can't get to each other. Obviously in the wild, they'd be competitors for prey. Um, but they can see, smell, hear and interact with each other in that regard. And that in, in itself, just designing their habitat that way is very enriching. So I'm going to now show you a little video from Kelly, one of our chimpanzee keepers. And she's going to show you some part of their habitat, um, which we installed not that long ago. And it's all about um, developing that natural behaviour. Um, and it's not what you think. Let me play it for you. And uh, if you let me know if the sound's working, because I can't hear it at my end. Uh, the reason we put them in is because we wanted to create something that they could use in natural behaviour. So different, dif uh, different chimp communities will actually um, fish for termites. It's one of their favourite foods. Others may hunt other monkeys. It does depend on whereabouts in Africa they're actually from. Um, it is a learned behaviour. Um, and obviously we just made fake ones. So around the front of it, it actually has holes they can stick sticks in and actually fish out food. Um, but this obviously has to be padlocked because chimpanzees are very, very strong animals. 
so we padlock it um, and then inside we have trays and we actually put some food in that so you can see the remnants so this is when we were in here last we've actually lost some of their sticks in here as well um, but we basically just put a bit of food usually peanut butter or jam um, on there and then we will uh, leave some browse or sticks around for them that they can use to fish it out all right so hopefully that sound worked i can't hear the video at my end that's interesting um, it's a little bit quiet. Okay. Um, so I'm not sure if we can turn the audio up for the next ones. Um, so That's all right. It's um it is fully up, but I'll um I'll see what I can play with on the next one. So um this oops, there we go. So that's Kelly talking about our termite mounds. We've actually got two of them on um habitat. And it is so interesting to see them interact and use them. And I think Kelly said in that part that not every group of chimpanzees in the wild use termite mounds for their protein but it's a learned behavior that they pass down through their culture essentially so different family groups will do this and others will do other ways of getting extra protein um here's another one of kelly talking about chimpanzees have tough they are. Like us, so they can actually undo these things and we don't want them to be able to pull it down so so she's explaining in that one that we use these bolts that hold up to a ton because of how strong chimpanzees are. So when we think of enrichment, we're looking at the species and we're going, okay, well, are they gonna break things easily? So if you think about big animals in the zoo, what would you think we have to think about? What species would we go, oh, we have to build it really tough. Can anyone give me any answers apart from chimpanzees? Any ideas on what we'd have to build really tough? So we've got chimps and orangutans being another one, really strong. We build things tough for them. You might yeah. think, yep. Gorillas, elephants, tigers. Yeah, all those animals, our elephants in particular, we have to build it either indestructible if we can or easily replaceable if we don't mind if they break them. So I'm going to show you now a video of our chimps using that. There's no sound for this one, so I'll talk over it. But um, our chimps, when they first discovered the termite mains, had to work had to work out how to use it because they've never used it. They um, they've never seen a chimpanzee use one of these before. So the the keepers actually left some branches in there ready for them so they could come and pull it out and realize that there's yummy things inside. And they worked it all out themselves and taught each other, which is pretty clever. So they stick, they actually get the brows, the sticks themselves, they strip all the leaves off and they make themselves a tool so they can use it to get the yummy things inside. Um, and that's a really great enrichment item that mimics a natural behaviour and guests will engage with that. So part of what we try and encourage here being those natural behaviours is not just the benefit of our animals, but that's our primary focus. It also engages guests and they go, wow, that's a really cool behaviour. I didn't know they did that. And we can then explain or we might have signs up that explain what is going on in that habitat and that this is actually something we're replicating from the wild, which is really exciting when people engage in that in that way. All right, then, of course, we've got some other animals and who doesn't have a pet cat that loves boxes? So the termite mound is a complex one that we had to spend some money on and some design to make sure that chimpanzees couldn't break it. But we can use simple things as well, like a cardboard box and it had, might have um, some perfume or some other things sprayed on it, or some herbs inside to engage the senses. So let's see if we can now name all of the five senses that we're trying to engage. See if you can throw one into the chat. Oh, we've got smell. Yes, yeah, smell, it's a great one. I just mentioned that one, awesome. Touch. Touch, it's two. Ooh, uh, sight. Sight, yep. Hearing. Yep. And taste. Awesome. We got all five. Well done. So all of those five senses, we try and engage our animals every day to use all five of their senses. Now, some animals like snakes don't really hear, um, but we can do other things to engage them in their environment. So for our tiger here, he's tasting it. You can see he's taking some chunks out of it. He's touching it all over. Um, he's smelling it um so there's lots of things happening and it makes a noise itself so it kind of covers a whole range there of different senses for him but sometimes what we would do we might just go around their habitat and spray perfume in different spots so it's something they can't see but when they go out there in the mornings they go oh that smells different 
what's over there? Because sometimes you find they roll in it and they go, oh, this is nice. Um, or we can sprinkle herbs and, um, and spices around as well that are safe for our animals. Um, our big cats love perfumes. They're just this, this amazing um, scents all around. They actually, actually, actually do love them. But like I said, it doesn't have to be complex. A cardboard box is good enough for lots of cats, including our tigers. So we then have, let's have a look. This is the video I was talking about before. So we um, recently put a big climbing pole in for Charlie and on the top there, he's got his morning tea. So let's see if he can get up there. So this was a big job to put all that rope around the climbing pole and he uses it without food up there. The first time he used it, there was nothing up there. He just thought, this is awesome. I'm going to climb up this. Um, and it's just like, you know, your scratching post or, or a climbing frame you have at home for your little cats. We try and um, that's one way that at home you can enrich your animals. And that's a natural behavior, even though it's not actually up a tree or anything like that. It is instigating that behavior, which is pretty special to see when Charlie likes to go up and do this. I'm going to replay it because how cool is that? Um, it's one of my favorite videos. So he's checking it out. He's going, can I get up there? Yes, yes, I can. Big leap. Look how high he jumps as well. So if he was a cheetah, we're not going to put that in a cheetah habitat. So we have to think about cheetahs and go, well, they're not going to climb a climbing pole, but they run really fast. Now, I don't have any footage of that, but you can imagine we might want to use um, some drones or some um, lures or even some remote control cars to try and engage our cheetahs in a behaviour that they do really well, which is chase. So there's always species-specific things that we're looking to do for our animals. Um, we've just had a great question come through about yeah. how they put this, the meat up the pole. How did they get his uh, morning tea up? Uh, very good question. Yeah, that's a great question. So we have um, our team of keepers and we also have, uh, we have ladders and other things like that. Um, so Charlie would not be on exhibit when we're putting food out. So he gets pulled into his den, like I talked with the, talked about with the chimpanzees. Um, the team would go out there with a ladder or even a pole that has the food on the end, they can pop it back up on the pole. Um, it doesn't take too long uh, and they, yeah, pack it all down and take it out. But a really good question. Today, I actually, um, we put in some enrichment with some students in our elephant habitat, which is really heavy. And so our elephant team use, we call it the green machine. It's a little um, um, earth mover. So that has a forklift and things on it. And that's how we actually attach some of the really heavy items in some of our larger animal habitats. We have to use machinery because it's, it's really too heavy to pick up from our perspective, from, from people. We need like five people to pick things up. So that we do use tools. Um, like ladders and earth movers to get things um, sorted. A great question. But this one is a scent based one. So this is one of our hyenas having a great time. So can you see the little patch of straw that they're rolling around in? That is actually, um, that is actually lion bedding. So we can take bits of uh, habitat from some animals and put them in with others, as long as it's safe to do so. And in this case, we've taken lion bedding that they've rolled around in and, and got all their smell and potentially even a bit of urine in there. And we will collect that all up and take it and put it in something like our hyenas. And they roll around in that and have a great time. And if you have a pet dog, you may have noticed that they like to roll around in smelly things when you go out to the park, even really gross things. Um, and so our, our zoo animals like to do that too. So we provide them with those opportunities to get all smelly and, and things like lion bedding. So, and we would swap the same, go from hyenas to lions and they, they love doing the same thing. So um, it's really interesting to see how our pet lives can mimic wild animals too. Mm. Um, so, yeah. I was just going to say, we've got another question that's come through Ooh. about how often you change different habitat aspects. Yeah. Awesome. So we try and make sure that every single day is a little bit different for our animals. Um, obviously, depending on what you're changing, some things take a lot more effort than others, um, but we might change out the sand that's in the elephant barn for their bedding um, every so often. But every single day, there'll be some new enrichment that goes in. So it might not be a whole habitat change, but it might be that the termite mounds are filled up a couple of times a week or a couple of times a month. Um, and we do have a bit of a rotating schedule depending on the team that's um, working. So we wanna make sure that every day is not predictable for our animals too. So particularly our really smart primates, um, we make sure that, every, that we don't have a seven day schedule. We wanna make sure that 
over the next month or two, every day is slightly different. So there's a lot of changes happening. It means a lot of planning and a lot of creation of different things too. So it's a lot of work, but it's made, um, made as part of the routine for our um, animal care team. A really good question. There's no definitive answer because it does depend on the species and what we're, what we're doing. Um, but this is another way we can enrich. So we, we talked about our sensory. So this is also sensory. It's taste, obviously, and smell. But we do a lot of food-based enrichment. So if you were to just feed your pet or any animal in the zoo just in a bowl um, and they eat all their food at once, it, it's A, a little bit boring, but B, um, it doesn't really stimulate any, any wild behaviours like foraging. So this is a little foraging board that um, they created just out of a, a piece of recycled plastic, drilled some holes in it. And um, in the wild, she'd be going around looking for different things on branches. She might find um, some food like that just sitting in one spot, but it's not easy for her to get. So that's just one way um, we can enrich as well. So we've talked about the sensory, we've talked about the environment and changing uh, the actual habitat itself. And then we've got these, and these are called environmental enrichment devices. So EEDs for short, but I'll, I'll call them our enrichment devices for today. And we have lots of them. And this is where I'm going to show you a few things in person. So I'm going to switch back from the screen share. Um, and then we'll come back to some more videos in a minute. So did that stop? I think I am back on big screen. That yeah. is um, all sorted. And one of the questions that's just come through as well while you're on yeah. your is how do the animals deal with the heat? Ah, good question. So um, a lot of them really don't mind. They're from quite warm climates. So a lot of our animals um, have hot summers where they're adapted to live, but we do provide um, things like access to their dens and a lot of them have air conditioning, a bit nicer than my house. Um, and uh, we do things like ice block feeds. So we might freeze meat or freeze blood for the carnivores. We might freeze fruit and veggies in for our zebras and giraffe and other animals um, so that they've got some cold food that they can um, they can eat and lick and, and eat over time. That helps them to cool down, just like if we were to eat an ice block. So we do all those kinds of things. We have misting stations. So um, we have them for humans in the zoo as well as the animals, which provides a nice cooling, um, cooling mist that goes over the habitat. So there's quite a few ways we do that. And we are, because we are a brand new zoo we've only been open for four years we've planted lots of trees you can see some of them here and you can only plant certain size trees so we planted the biggest trees we could and it'll take a few more years for them to grow really really big but they're starting to now provide that really nice shade and where we don't have those big trees we've been building lots of different um, shade structures in all of our habitats so they all have a lot of access to shade so a really good question um so behind me i've got our enrichment hub that i've been sharing with people as they come through the zoo um, I'm going to go, um, I might take you with me, see how this goes. So I've got a couple of things, some enrichment devices to show you. All right. So one of the first ones is this really big ball. So I'm going to push it back a little bit and see if um, I move the camera. See if you can see these scratches. So these are from Charlie, the same tiger that you saw in that climbing frame. We buy these in because they have to be made really tough so that they can't chew pieces off and hurt themselves by swallowing it. Um, and they don't get destroyed really easily and we waste a lot of money trying to replace balls all the time. So these are specifically made for zoo animals like tigers and lions and hyenas. Um, but he's got such sharp claws and teeth, you can see how much of a gouge he's made out of those. But they go out, we throw them in the moat because they've got, they, they swim in the moat here. Um, they'll jump on them and run around after them and have a great time. We can put smells on them and all sorts, but we don't give them every day. So um, he doesn't get this, he hasn't had this all week. I've been using it out here, but he's got multiple ones. He's got a really big one here. And we've got some smaller hyena ones. Have a look at this tire though. This here. Can you guess what animal plays with that? I saw a question come through just now. Elephant, well done, Millie. Um, so that is one of our elephant tires and it's not our biggest one either. It's huge. I'll show you how big it is. Pretty big tire. And that is one of our sort of medium sized ones we give our elephants. And it takes 
a forklift to bring it in here. It's very, very heavy. Um, but out in um, on exhibit, we usually chain them down to things because they're so strong, they can actually pick it up and move it. And we've had issues where we didn't chain one down and it got stuck. Um, they put it right where the gate is to close. And so we couldn't close the gates um, when they needed to go into their bedroom. So we have to always think about, okay, safety for the animals, but also safety for keepers. So if we can't close them into their dens, we can't go in and clean around them. So they eventually moved it because they've got such great relationship with their keepers that um, they asked them to move it and they moved it for them. So um, it's perfect. Uh, well, that so, links to one of our questions that's come through. Yeah. Has anyone been injured by the animals? Um, not here, no. So we're um, what we call protected contact. So all of our dangerous animals, um, so basically anything that has the capacity to do real harm, we don't go in with them, if that makes sense. So um, we do protected contact means there's always a fence between you and that animal. So for our elephants, um, I'll show you a video a bit later of, of um, one of our elephants doing some training. You'll notice there's always a fence between Joe, the trainer, and the elephant. Um, they can interact and touch through the fence, but there is no um, person in the habitat with the animal. Uh, with some of our smaller animals, we do go in th with things like meerkats and porcupines and um, capybaras and go in and do encounters with them. There may have been a nip or a bite here or there if an animal gets too enthusiastic, but we don't have any, any major injuries that's ever happened. Yeah. Be scary if there was, but yes, we don't we don't find too many of those. Um, I did see another question come through. Are there engineers or architects who design the habitats? Oh, cool. Um, yes, we um, we do. Um, when we first designed the zoo, yes, we had we did have some um, engineers who specifically look at zoos, uh, work with our animal care team. So they look at the animal and what it needs then they look at okay how do we safely work that animal so how is the safety around um and even just the looking at an oh at work health and safety perspective what are the ergonomics so if i'm going to go into a reptile enclosure for example do i have to climb up a ladder and into a little back door and am i going to bump my head on a branch so there's all kinds of things that um that go into it when we design a habitat um so that's a really good question um, so how do you give their tigers food because they will attack you? I think I answered this one a little bit earlier in that we, um, we call our animals in to their uh, dens first. So if we're cleaning the den, they're out on, on their habitat. And if we need to clean the habitat, we call them into the den and we lock a door between us and the animal at all times. So um, they are all trained. So we train lots of animals and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, but we do lots of training with all our animals, including some of our fish. Um, and yeah, just to make sure that we're always safe and they're always safe. Um, we do work with animals. I work with reptiles a lot. So I'm the education coordinator here at Sydney Zoo. We use a lot of reptiles in our, um, our, in our uh, workshops and things. I don't have any here today because I'm talking more about the animal enrichment. And are we making new habitats? We have been upgrading some habitats, but we um, haven't got any um, new habitats on the horizon at the moment. And when we do, um, we recently released our lemurs onto their new habitat, but it was an upgraded or changed habitat that used to house our capybaras. So yeah, some really cool questions there. Um, I am gonna just bring over a couple of different items to the camera rather than take the camera over there. And um, I'll move this back a little bit so I'm not glary in the sun. I'll be right back. And I'm gonna show you some fun things. Make sure you keep putting your fabulous questions in the Q&A while Jess comes back oh, with an arm full of things. Yeah, I was like, oh, I probably should have grabbed these before we started, but I forgot, so there we go. Um, so a couple of things, and they don't look fancy. So I actually picked the least fancy things because it doesn't have to be fancy to be enriching. Uh, and it doesn't have to be expensive either because we do have budgets just like any other workplace. Um, and we want to make sure we can do the best for our animals in a budget that we have to stick to. So even things like this. So hopefully everyone knows what a CD is. Um, most of the younger people might not, but we do have um, CDs here. We use them for a mobile or our... Oh, good. I've got some carnival keepers walking past. We're talking all about Charlie and his climbing pole. So everyone was very excited about that. But we use these for penguins because they love chasing the reflection. 
So um, we've also got things like this, which is a huge one. This, how big it is. Um, this is actually a giraffe puzzle feeder. So puzzle feeders are one way we can give food um, as enrichment that make it really hard or more difficult, more problem solving skills for that animal to get their food. Just like if they're in the wild, it's not just on a platter for them, they have to work for it. And so with this type of puzzle feeder, the giraffe has a really long tongue. So if you think about a ruler, you might have a ruler on your desk right now, but a ruler is about 30 centimetres long. Their tongue is 40 centimetres long. Very long tongue, much longer than mine. I won't show you. Um, but they, in the wild, use their tongue to wrap around the leaves on a branch, around all of the little thorns, pull all the leaves off and then eat it. And in captivity, in, in the zoo, we do a similar thing. We give them lots of browse, so those branches, they'll eat all the leaves. But we also give them food, other foods, so straw and hay and little veggies in here. They have to use their tongue to find all the food in here, just like they'd be wrapping it around branches in the wild. And that develops all the strength in their tongue and their lips um, and provides a little bit of a problem for them to solve, which is important for our animals to not, um, not be bored and having to think about things is really good for everybody. So that's one puzzle feeder. Two more kinds of puzzle feeders. And I'm gonna see if you can guess what kind of animal we put this in with. So this one here, what animal do you think we'd use this with? Definitely not a chimpanzee, they'd break it in two seconds. Any thoughts? Where's the chat? There it is. We've got a lemur suggestion. Lemur, meerkat. Meerkat is correct from Millie there. So we do, we do use it for meerkats. We have used it for otters as well. So little carnivores in our team here. So we put little food in here. Um, they have to, they come along and they can smell it and they can see it and they go, how do I get that out of there? And they start playing with it. And then all of a sudden one will tip it over and food will come out and then they all get excited and they start to, to play with it all. Um, I made one for my puppy many years ago. Um, this is not a new design, but this was designed by a bunch of year 11 students doing a biology program. Um, and the keepers loved it so much they asked to keep it, which is pretty nice. So that's one thing we use of our meerkats. And this is another puzzle feeder that the same group of students came up with. The leaves are just decorative for this week. But there's little holes. If you look closely, there's some little holes here that the food goes in and you can easily clean it by taking the caps off because that's also another thing with enrichment. Are you going to throw it away or can we reuse it? How do we clean it and make it sanitary for our animals to not eat yucky food that's been stuck in there for days? So this was a puzzle feeder that the meerkats had to climb all over and find and put their, their hands in and try and get the food as it was in there. So we gave them mealworms um, and they loved it. This was a really popular one too. So the keepers asked to keep that one. Um, but I'm going to switch back now. I'm going to turn around and ooh, um, I am going to. Oh, yeah. Were there a few questions? I yes, we too. do have a few questions. Uh, <laughs> Jenny's very keen to know where the capybaras are. Oh, where are the capybaras? So the capybaras are not far from me, actually, around the corner. Um, they're not here on um, on the virtual today with me, unfortunately. Uh, I would like to go hang out with the capybaras any day, but they are next to our, they're between our cheetahs and our camels. So technically in our African section, but the, they're South American. We don't have a South American section here at the zoo, so they're kind of on their own over there. Um, um, another question yep. was, how old's Charlie? Charlie is actually an old boy. Um, oh, I just had the carnival keepers here. He and his two sisters are all, I believe, around 16. So they are older tigers. Wow. So, um, yeah, they've been at another zoo. Obviously, we haven't been around for 16 years. They arrived last year. So, um, um, Do you have a favourite zoo animal? Oh, that's a really tough one because um, I work with so many, but I have been – I've. I helped hand raise and look after and I helped train some sugar gliders. So Walnut um, and Waddle were two, a brother and sister that came to the zoo. So I loved Walnut and Waddle. Fabulous. And there's a question about how to become a zookeeper, which is great because we just did our career in science. Uh, so how do you get to where you are? All right. So I am a zookeeper, but I'm also a science teacher. I've got a few different things. But um, zookeepers here at Sydney Zoo um, tend to have volunteered and spent some time learning as a volunteer and, and work placement in a lot of places. But they've also gone and done usually two different certificates at TAFE or similar. So certificate two in animal care um, 
so that they then have the prerequisite to get into the certificate three in, um, in, in animals in human care, which is a zookeeping course at TAFE. Um, once you finish your certificate three, which is about 18 months, and it includes work placement and getting signed off on lots of skills, then you are technically a qualified zookeeper. Um, and then you can try and get into the zoo industry, which is very competitive. Um, so the more experience you get volunteering and spending time and building relationships within the industry is really important. Um, and building your own skills and your own confidence with different types of animals too. So that's generally the path that most of our zookeepers take to get in to work in the industry. Excellent. Thank you. I'll let you keep going. We'll come back to uh, some of the questions yeah. later on. Awesome. Yeah, I'll make sure I've got a few minutes. Um, so we'll, we'll come back to that. I'm going to um, go back to some videos um, to make sure I don't miss any because there's some really cool ones in there because um, I've talked a little bit about um, the enrichment devices. So here's some other examples of enrichment devices with our otters it's made out of fire hose. So um, we recycle fire hose. So the fire department actually has to get rid of fire hose after a couple of years of use, even if it never actually was used, it was just coiled up on the truck. Um, it needs to be replaced so that it never fails because imagine it failing at a fire, that's not good. And otherwise it would go to landfill. So there's not many um, places, places or ways you can recycle fire hose. So we actually use it here and we build things like this device. We made little cubes out of it and sewn them together and it's a little puzzle feeder for our otters. Um, we've also got, um, big hammocks that we build. So the uh, the big hammock you saw in the very beginning of the chimps, um, uh, it was made out of fire hose. And then we've got all kinds of um, rafts and, and really fun things that the keepers have made for, for lots of different animals out of fire hose. And you can see bolts to hold it all together. We've got a little ball here with Tashi, our red panda. So that's a puzzle feeder as well. She has to move it around and the food falls out. So some people might have this at home for their dogs or cats, different varieties of these kind of puzzle feeders. She's so cute and fluffy. That's inside her den, in case you're wondering where that is, because that doesn't look like her habitat. Uh, and then some more things with our otters. So we've used some bamboo here to just, um, you can kind of see there's some shrimp stuck on there because they eat fish and shrimp. Um, and it's just a different way of them getting food. And we're just using some natural items that were around. We feed our red pandas bamboo and so that's just some off cuts of the bamboo that we would normally feed out and you can see they've got a pond so being an aquatic animal we give them a big they've actually got a like big water slide in there too which is a lot of fun <clears throat> and then that feeder again so it's a popular one um, style to just share the food around they're all having a turn and it means one animal can't dominate as well if you've got a big social group so I've gone through the environment, how we change it up. I've gone through the five senses and how we engage those. I've gone through environmental enrichment devices. There's two other ways we enrich our animals and one is social grouping. So meerkats, for example, we wouldn't keep by themselves because they are a social animal. Um, but tigers usually are a solitary animal. Charlie actually lives with one of his sisters, but he has for his entire life. Um, but generally you'll find animals like tigers are actually by themselves on habitat at zoos. And people often wonder why they don't have a friend and it's because they don't want one. So some animals very much prefer to be on their own um, and other animals like me, cats are very social. And then our otters live in a pair bond. So they live just one male, one female. And if they ever have babies, they would live with them for a while until they're too old. And then the parents would be like, hello, you need to move house. And we would organize with another zoo for them to move elsewhere. Um, so there's an egg carton with our otters. So it doesn't have to be expensive, like I said, some really cheap ways of um, engaging animals with um, foraging. So he's reaching in with his hands, trying to pull the food out, which is a natural foraging behavior. And then we move on to a cognitive thing. So the last of the five ways we enrich is cognitive and training. So this is Joe and Ashoka. Um, and I won't turn the sound up on this one because it is very soft, um, but she says star and he chooses the star out of the square and the star. Um, because they're doing a lot of shape recognition with them at the moment. And the elephants do at least four training sessions a day with their keepers. And they have such a strong bond with their keepers. Um, they can get them to lie down. They can do hand injections. They draw blood from behind their ear if a vet needs to check their bloods because they're sick, um, because they have that trust. And so training any animal in the zoo is so important. Like I was saying earlier, with making sure they move into the den or back out onto habitat, it provides um, 
that trust between animal and, and human so that we can um, work with them really safely. And if we were needed to draw blood from an animal that wasn't trained, for example, you might need the vet to come in and shoot them with a dart gun. And nobody wants that. And a lot of animals get really badly bruised from that. And we don't have to do that at our zoo because all of our animals that we ever need to do that with, we can hand inject or hand draw blood um, because we've built that trust and that training with them. So this animal, Ashoka, in front of you on the screen, he also recognises smells. So the keepers have been working hard. Um, they don't have to say a command anymore and say, hey, like lift up your trunk. They can give them a smell. Maybe it's mint and they can't see what it is. It's inside a capsule. I don't have any footage of that yet. We're still working on that. But, um, but they will smell it and then they will do the behaviour that they've linked with it. So they can, you can ask them to do it with a hand gesture now. You can ask verbally or you can give them a smell and they recognise all those three things ask the same question and they will give you the same behaviour that they know is associated with it. So they're very, very smart. And the training also provides that cognitive problem solving. What are they trying to get me to do? Awesome. And provides that trust building. So it's such a great way um, to engage our animals. This, oops, why did I zoom that in? This is Dexter. And this video is actually sped up four times faster than it is in real life because he's so slow. Um, but Dexter is what we call an alligator snapping turtle and he does training too. So like I said, you can train any animal and we've trained Dexter or well, the aquarium team has trained Dexter to do what's called target training. And we do target training with pretty much every animal in the zoo. Um, and that means that they'll follow a target, which is that red ball for Dexter. I'll play it again. Um, and he'll follow it wherever they want him to go. And so they'll give him a reward for that. So for every behavior or um, follow of the target stick that we ask our animals to do, we need to reward them for that and say, thanks. Um, thanks for doing what I asked you to do. So he got, can you see what it is? Can anyone see what Dexter's eating? A bit yucky, unless you like eating them. See if anyone can see what that is. It is a dead rat, if yep. you were guessing that. Awesome, got some guesses. Yep. So he does eat rats, he eats fish and things like that too. But we use tongs to feed Dexter because he could easily bite our hands off. So he's one of those animals. We don't go in with Dexter. Um, we make sure that he's out of the way before we go in and clean with him. And then the last video, I think it's the last video I've got to share, is target training our sharks. So like I said, training any animal, you can see that green lid, it's actually a bucket lid, um, is a target for our sharks. They come and then they take their food. So they are trained now to come up there. And eventually the goal is that we could hand inject them if we needed to give them a vaccination or, or antibiotics or anything like that if they had an infection um, because they're trained to come up calmly and be next to keepers at their target. So lots of different ways we use training to benefit our animals. So I'm going to come back to, whoops, to stop screen sharing. Um, and now I don't know how many minutes I've got left, but I can answer any questions that people have. Because I think there's we do have a few questions that have come through. Um, so I can read through the Q&A, is that easier? I'll just open that up and, and then I can go to the chat. Is that the best? Um, yeah, I can, I can read them out to you. So we had a few just about Dexter. One was yep. how big is Dexter and how old is Dexter? Um, so Dexter, I think, um, is 13-ish years old. Um, he can get a few decades old. They're, they're a long-lived turtle. Um, for scale, oh, I'm just trying to think how I can show you how big Dexter is. Um, so... Dexter weighs probably about 35 kilos um, and he would be um, about this big. So he's a big boy um, and he will get bigger. So I've worked with alligator snapping turtles before and um, he's not the biggest I've worked with. Um, I don't work with him here, the aquatics team do, but they get really large. Uh, you, don't, you don't pick up that sense of scale. I think there's uh, lots of people. That ball is about this big. Yeah. Wow. So it really was a rat, not a not a not a small mouth, a big rat. Wow, that's amazing. And that really links to what Hugo was asking about how much food do the animals need each week? Oh, that is a good question. So um they they need uh, many tons of food in a week. So um it takes about four hours to prepare just our primate food every day, and they go through something like 80 kilos of veg a day. Um and we've got Yes, there's a lot of food. There's a whole team, um, a nutrition team uh, that work to provide all that food every day. They're the first people to start in the morning to make sure that there's enough food and everything's prepared perfectly for the, for the rest of the zoo. So I don't have an exact figure, but yes, many tons of food in a week. 
<laughs> um, another question from Michelle is, does the shark have a name? Yes, um, we got two sharks in there. So Luca and Nala, are, um, they're two females. Lovely. Um, how many capybaras do you have at the zoo? Oh, good question. I think we have four at the moment. We just had um, two have gone to another zoo recently. Okay. Now, we've got a, a question about what age do you need to be to volunteer at the zoo? Oh, okay. So we only take volunteers if they're doing their current certificate three or a certificate two um, at TAFE. And so we have, I think our youngest is probably 17 at the moment. We do have things like mini zookeeper for a day and cadet zookeeper for a day where you come on a program for the day and learn the behind the scenes. You get to do lots of things during the day. Um, so you can come and do those programs. We don't have a volunteer program yet for anyone younger. Yeah, well, that pretty much answers the um, next question about what programs are good for children. So, yeah, those full day um, mini keepers are fabulous programs for, for children to, to get involved and see what it's like. Yeah, that's right. So um, a keep day or, yeah, or cadet keep, keep it for a day. What do you think is the cutest animal in the zoo? I've got my favourite. Oh, I still think it's walnut and wattle, my sugar gliders that I work with. Um, I'm a little bit biased there. Um, but we do have a number of joeys that have just been coming out of the pouch and they are ridiculously cute. What's your favourite? <laughs> oh, I just the red pandas and the otters. Just Yeah, they are very cute too. Very fluffy. Um, another person was asking, you know, how do you enrich your pet at home? I think really what you were saying is lots of the same things. Exactly. So if you you can if you have a pet cat or even a rabbit, we've target trained rabbits before and guinea pigs, um, you can do training with them and just find the one thing that they love. So it might be carrots or it could be some kind of straw. Or it could be playing. Um, training is such a great cognitive way of engaging with your animal and building that trust. Um, I used to spray different perfumes in cardboard boxes around my living room for my dog and she would go around and destroy the boxes but have a great time for an hour while I was out, you know, um, doing all kinds of those things. You can get them all kinds of puzzle feeders. I have one somewhere that it's like one you buy and they have to move things to get the food underneath. Um, there's, you can do everything we, I've just talked about. You can do for your pets at home. Um, and there's lots of information online too um, that you can find about how to do enrichment for your pets at home. Well, slightly not a pet at home, but um, do the sharks fight for food if there's two of them? No, they don't. So you probably saw, uh, I think I cut that video a bit short because it was very long. Um, but we feed the barramundi. So they live in a tank. Uh, another way we can do social enrichment, which I didn't talk about, was you can have two different or multiple species in an exhibit at the same time that would be found in the wild together. So we have barramundi and all kinds of different fish in there. And we feed them on the opposite side of the habitat to the sharks and we feed them at the same time. So everyone in a tank knows if it's, if it's feeding time, um, the keepers go and do a certain thing and the barramundi and all the other fish go to the other side and then the two sharks come and feed there um, and they just take turns. And sometimes they're sitting there together eating and because they're very well fed, they don't have a real urgency to, to catch their food and to, to compete for food. So um, we manage that very specifically for the sharks because we don't want them hunting the other fish in there either. So they get trapped to feed at a certain point and the fish Oh, sometimes the barramundi are cheeky and they actually come and steal the shark food <laughs> rather than the other way around. But, um, but yeah, we've managed that very closely. Um, we've got time for a couple more questions. So we've got uh, what is the largest animal the zoo has ever had? Is that your elephants? It is. Um, Saigon was our largest animal so far. She passed away sadly or more than 18 months ago now. She was a very old um, female elephant, but the boys now weigh three tons each. Um, and she was probably close to four ton and they'll get bigger than that eventually when they've grown up. Wow. And what do they eat was another question from Cindy. From elephants? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so we feed them a lot of different kinds of hay. Um, so just like if we eat too many Mars bars and things, it's not so great for us. We have to make sure we're eating a balanced diet. Our nutritionist who works in our nutrition centre is constantly analysing the diets and weights and health of our animals. So um, well, they have a very high veggie diet and a very high hay diet. So they don't really get any fruit. Um, and so lots of lots of different kinds of hay. Um, we give them browse, so branches of different species that are edible for them, which they love. And they'll eat the bark and they'll eat the leaves, sometimes the whole thing. Um, and then they get lots of vegetables as well. <laughs> um, excellent. Um... One question that's come through a couple of times is how powerful is the bite of the snapping turtle? Oh, I don't know it in um in for in the actual force, but it would be 
enough to bite my hand off. So their head is very large. They have almost like a beak structure that um, clamps together. Um, and their main um, way of feeding in the wild, which um, is why they can be so dangerous, is, is an ambush predator. So they sit in a swamp, essentially, underwater. They need to breathe air and then they'll sit on the bottom for a while. And they sit with their mouth open and they have their, t- on their tongue. It's so weird. They have this little thing that wiggles like a worm. And so then the fish come along and they go, oh, worm, sweet. And they swim into its mouth and it goes bang. <laughs> and uh, breath it. so their their neck is actually very long it doesn't look in that video very long but he would be able to reach out really far and um and if he grabbed your hand it would be you know he'd bite a fish in half no worries so mm. yeah and where are they found they're from the southern half of the united states kind of area so they're not local they're an american alligator snapping turtle yeah well, that's incredible. And when I share the recording with everyone, I will share. Good afternoon, it. members and visitors. Sorry. A friendly reminder. <laughs> well, that is closing time by the sounds of it. So we will share some links to Sydney Zoo. So um, you will be able to have a look at some of the programs they do and some other information. So one of the other questions was, is there a map of the zoo? You'll be able to find all of those uh, kinds of things. Um, that was just the announcement. So thank all you. Right. No problems. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing those amazing innovations. Um, I think there was lots of things that people probably didn't realise how complicated um, and how diverse the um, programs are that you do to make sure the animals are as happy and healthy as they can be. Cool. Thanks for having us. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. And just remember, we have two more days of SciFest coming up as well. This National Science Week project is supported by the Australian Government and proudly brought to you by Virtual Excursions Australia.